Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants who have joined us. Thank you for doing this for this PRC, Performance Review Commission webinar on airport capacity in balance. I'm going to make a short introduction. So today's objective for this uh, webinar is that we talk a little bit about runway configuration and the impact on capacity and performance, how to measure it, how to factor it. We will talk about the issue of imbalance in runway system capacity between different runway configurations. The study is about the impact of runway configurations on airport capacity and performance. Naturally, we refer to runway system capacity and ANS performance, as normally runway configurations do not impact the other elements of airport capacity, like terminal capacity or apron capacity. We will present to you the technical note with indicator we designed for this and the methodology. However, this study is not about the impact on COVID. In fact, the data which was used is from 2019. We will offer the floor to external speakers. So we have uh, put together a very nice panel of uh, speakers to see how airport planners take this issue into account on the long-term planning and how the different stakeholders also deal with this potential lack of capacity symmetry in those airports where there is an issue. My name is Mark Baumgartner. I'm the chairman of the Performance Review Commission and my day job is an air traffic controller in Geneva. It is a pleasure now to uh, introduce the panelists of today and I'm starting on the left with Dr. Jan Malakok, who graduated in 1989 from the Faculty of Aeronautics of Orseva Technical University. Since then, he has been working on various experts, managerial and advisory position in aviation industry, including airplane manufacturer, airline, airport and civil aviation authority enterprises. He is also a lecturer at the University of Warsaw, Interdisciplinary Center for Mathematical and Computational Modeling, and other academic institution and currently leads aviation project in the ACM University of Warsaw, including the joint ICAO-ICM development of global air transport analytics and is member of Euro Control Performance Review Commission. Jan is the mastermind behind the study from the PRC and he will be presenting the concept. Sarah Menson Mancha. Sarah graduated in aeronautical engineering at the Polytechnic University of Madrid and started working in ATM in 2000 doing fast time simulation analysis for airspace and airports. In 2004, she moved to Brussels to work for Eurocontrol doing airport capacity studies and operational analysis. In 2016, she joined the Performance Review Unit supporting the Performance Review Commission and becoming the airport focal point. Sarah will give us an overview of the approach and the methodology used in the study with a brief description of the results included in it. I move on to one of the external speakers, Matthias Hanke. Matthias studied mechanical, mechanical engineering and business administration at the Technical University in Darmstadt. He is currently working for Roland Berger and is the managing partner Switzerland, head of consumer goods and retail in Europe and member of the European Aviation Travel and Logistics Section. In this job, he combines index insight into consumer goods and retail e-commerce business with similarly structured questions in the aviation and leisure industry. He has conducted over the years many strategic and operation airline projects in Europe, Middle East and in Asia. He has also worked previously for Swiss Airlines with responsibility for network planning, route profitability management, revenue management and pricing and external relations. Matthias, as a former responsible for network, will give us a perspective from the airlines point of view. I move on to Manuel Dorado. Manuel mastered in aeronautical engineering in the Polytechnical University of Madrid. He started working in ATM in 1995, doing fast time simulation and operation and analysis for Enroute, TMA and airport capacity. Studies for the Spanish ANSP. He participated in several ATM R&D projects at European level and was focal point for collaboration projects between the USA and Europe. In 2010, he became head of simulation division in Enaire, the former AENA, in charge of the production process of validated ATM fast time simulation 
as part of the standard continuous enhancement and review procedures followed by INAIRE. Manuel will talk to us about the planning of the new runways for Madrid Airport, resulting in a symmetric capacity in terms of runway configuration. I move on. Mattes Kettner. Mattes is originally from Berlin and completed studies in aeronautical engineering there in 2008. After that, he moved to Zurich Airport and worked there in the operation engineering department over the years. He has been particularly involved in capacity increasing and punctuality improving measures, respectively project with the partner Swiss and Skyguide. In addition, he has represented the airport in various CSR projects. Since 2020, he's responsible for leading performance management at Zurich Airport. Mattes will talk to us about how an airport like Zurich with asymmetrical runway configurations manages this potential unbalance in the capacity. Last but not least, Didier Hock. Didier Hock is since last October the new chairman of the European Association of Airport Slot Coordinators. He started working in Sabina and the Brussels Airlines where he had several positions including airport slot coordination, network manager in the OCC, and head of schedule and slots. Since 2006, he's the general manager of the Belgian slot coordination. Didier, a slot coordinator, will inform us about the airport capacity imbalance is factored in the slot allocation process. So thank you very much to everybody who has agreed to join us this morning uh, to make a presentation and also give us some insight on uh, what they think what the PRC has published, uh, how this uh, actually is reflected in your daily operation, what are the benefits. Now, before we enter into the, the discussions and the presentation, here the agenda of today. So uh, we will listen to a few presentations as outlined, and then hopefully by towards the end of uh, the, the morning, we will have an opportunity also to address some of your questions. And I will move on with regard to exchange with the panelists and also with the people in the background. If you have a problem, then use please the chat box. If you wish to ask a question, then do not use the chat box. Use the question and answer box. And there, it would be very nice if you have a question for a panelist that you say a question for this panelist and then you then send it. We will try also to answer, not just waiting until the Q&A in the end, but to answer your questions as well in writing via this feature of the question and answering. So that um, finishes actually my introductory remark, and I would like to hand over to Jan for the next agenda. Thank you. Very good morning. It's my great pleasure to have this presentation for such a numerous and prestigious audience. Uh, airport capacity planning process is a complex issue which requires to be taken and tuned in a permanent feedback with performance results. It requires uh, the consideration and correlation of several factors like airport location, design and construction, aircraft fleet types and mix, weather, regulations, including environment, uh, automation, technology and support. It's a multi-stakeholder influence process. In order to illustrate the purpose of this study, which is the determination of airport runway system capacity resilience, the potential operational constraints disruption sequence will be analyzed. Capacity declaration can often include some buffer which as a consequence can deteriorate the available capacity. This is a basis for a slot distribution, airline operations planning and such schedule generation. Operational constraints like critical crosswind, which can suddenly occur and potentially deteriorate airport capacity when airport capacity resilience is not able to respond and compensate this disruption respective volume of operations, delays and cancellation may appear and subsequently result in loss of passenger and cargo connections, which substantially impacts the competitive advantage of air transport, air carrier and the airport itself. Runway system capacity is a primary issue of airport capacity. 
It's like no other element of airport capacity chain sensitive to external factors, which can rapidly cause rapidly capacity exhaustion. A lack of capacity symmetry may lead to throughput imbalance. PRR performance review report compares the declared peak arrival capacity in ideal conditions to actual throughput dispersion uh, degree. Difference between those values is in fact the declared capacity margin, which represents significant dispersion among different airports. Let's illustrate a problem with runway capacity operation sensitivity to the crosswind. Capacity imbalance is a percentage of lack of capacity in reference to declare capacity associated with the probability of its occurrence and the capacity resilience is expressed as a difference of 100% and the product of the capacity imbalance and the probability of its occurrence. Operations during strong crosswind may affect safety and result in misapproaches or necessity to divert to an alternate airport. Windrose is a very fundamental airport layout planning factor, mainly for runway directions, associated taxiways, rapid exit taxiways, the icing platforms and other elements, and ATC procedures, which in response aim to provide the same capacity level during all limiting potential crosswind directions. The area of the wind rows marked in pink color represents critical wind that restrict landing in two parallel runways and represents 4% of all winds depicted on these wind rows. In this case, all traffic scheduled on two runway, parallel runway must be transferred to, to one crossing runway. Based on the airport hourly capacity declaration, depending on the runway system in use, the values are respectively 83 for two parallel runways and 36 operations for crossing runway. Using previously presented formula, the airport capacity resilience can be determined, which in this case is 97.72%. Conclusions. Airport capacity imbalance metrics as delay cancellation risk assessment input have significant potential to be used by stakeholders like slot coordinators, ATCs, airports, airlines, uh, airport development planners, especially for airport operations monitoring and optimization process. This approach, uh, novel approach value consists of simultaneous expression of performance metric related to, be, to the probability of its occurrence. Presented methodology can be expanded to other airport runway constraint performance factors like night curfew, low visibility limitations, and other. Thank you very much for your attention, I, and I pass now the desktop for the next presentation. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, I had some feedback that my um, audio was very bad, so I tried to change it. So I will hand over now to Sarah to talk a little bit about the imbalance study and the approach we took to the study. Please, Sarah. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. When Dr. Malavko brought to us this idea, this concept of the, that he just presented to you of the airport capacity imbalance or symmetry, we thought that indeed, Runway configurations are a very important factor to be considered when talking about airport capacity and performance. And yet there was no indicator for it and maybe not enough awareness. So with this objective in mind, we decided to carry out this study and also we organized today's webinar. The objective of the study was to, uh, to extend the current operational performance studies at airports by identifying the potential capacity loss of uh, when using different uh, runway configurations. This will allow us to identify airports with uh, issues in terms of resilience to changes in runway configurations, suffering deterioration in capacity, performance, or both. 
And I must be clear, and I think Mark also mentioned it in the beginning, when we talk talk in the technical note about airport capacity and also in today's webinar we are referring to the runway system and taxiway system related capacity and performance we assume that runway configurations will have no impact in other components of the airport capacity like air, uh, apron or terminal and when we talk about the imbalance in the title this airport capacity imbalance we are referring to the imbalance between operating conditions for different runway configurations and not the imbalance between capacity and demand. Uh, the technical note was published last year in October uh, and we had a consultation period of about two months. So when we faced this study, uh, we identified three main elements to analyze. Uh, on one side, we need to know the runway configurations and how often they are operational. We also want to know the runway system capacity for each one of these runway configurations. And finally, we want to be able to measure the performance when using one configuration or another. So when looking for information on runway configurations, we realized that it was not available for all airports and very often not standardized. So we would find maybe a runway configuration defined as departure peak or night, but without a clear identification of which runways were used for arrivals or departures. Then we also found that some information was quite outdated or quite old. So as there is no clear methodology or there was no clear methodology for definition of a runway configuration, we decided to develop our own. For this, we use the APDF data. This is data, uh, a data flow established between the, the airport operators and Eurocontrol. And through this data flow, they provide to us on a monthly basis, details for each flight, including the runway use and the runway times. That is the departure, uh, the takeoff time for departures and the landing time for arrivals. Then when looking for the capacity values for each runway configuration, we again found ourselves that it was very difficult to find uh, the exact ca capacity for each runway configuration. And even when we would find it, uh, each airport has used different methodologies to come up with this capacity figure for a runway configuration. And this didn't really allow for, for us to, to have a homogeneous approach in, your, in our study to all airports in Europe. And again, this information would be often update, outdated because airport capacity studies are not carried out every year. And there are sometimes small operation, uh, uh, operational changes that impact that figure that was published uh, maybe a couple of years ago. So this is why we decided to use the peak service rate, uh, the percentile 99 of the hourly throughput as proxy for capacity. So if we have enough hours to analyze, uh, that is enough data sample, and we have enough demand in those hours, uh, the peak service rate uh, proves to be a good proxy for capacity. However, for, uh, we also calculated the total, uh, the maximum, sorry, the maximum per boot for those known BC airports where the peak service rate might not be the best approach. Finally, for the performance, we looked at the additional times as this is the way we can observe the impact on tactical of a change in configuration. The additional taxi out and additional asthma times are established performance indicators that are used in several performance schemes and that inform on the delays and the holdings in the approach phase or in the taxi out phase for departures, mainly due to the congestion of the runway system. The approach follows several steps to identify the runway configuration and calculate the peak service rate and the additional times for each configuration. This is all data-driven based on our airport operator data flow, which is currently established at 90 airports in Europe. The technical note explains all the details of this analysis and applies the method to 2019 data for these 90 airports. Now I will give you a quick overview of how we process the data. First of all, we take all these flights, all this APDF data, and we split the flights in 15 minutes intervals. Then we count the movements per runway in that interval. The idea is to identify for these 50 minutes which runways are active for what type of movement, arrivals or departures. 
then this will give us per se the runway configuration. Once we have assigned a runway configuration to each interval, we can then calculate the share of time each configuration was active, the probability of the configuration. We can also calculate the throughput for each hour with certain configuration, which will then allow us for the calculation of this percentile 99 that we are using as proxy for capacity. And we can then also assign to each movement certain runway configuration, and this will allow us to calculate the additional times per configuration. Finally, when uh, we can then calculate the resilience and the impact on the, uh, on the capacity, on the peak service rate, and the performance as defined in the technical note. In terms of results, we see the approach shows good coverage, more than 95% of the operation in terms of identifying a valid runway configuration for each time interval. The peak service rate as proxy for capacity provides the level of imbalance in throughput. And then the impact on the peak service rate combined with the impact on the additional times provides a comprehensive understanding of the imbalances detected. And it is important to clarify that the results shown in the technical note are a high level indication and cannot explain the reasons behind these results. For this, more detailed analysis would be required per airport, maybe using the same method, but breaking down the results per seasons, days of the week, times of the day, et cetera. This figure shows the results of the peak service rate for each configuration of the 30 busiest airports in 2019. And it illustrates the imbalances detected in the capacity. You can observe for each airport, one bubble per identified runway configuration indicating on the vertical axis the observed peak service rate. The size of the bubble represents the share of time that configuration was active. We can observe that many airports like Heathrow, Gatwick, Palma, or Tegel actually show equal or very similar capacity for any runway configuration, while other airports like Dusseldorf or Helsinki have very different peak service rates for different configurations with an important share of those configurations with lower capacity. Then we also might have some cases that show big capacity differences between configurations, so some configurations with a much lower peak service rate, but these are not so impacted because these configurations have a much lower share. So they are very um, less likely to, to be added. This graph shows the impact on the peak service rate on top and the impact on the additional times at the bottom. You can observe in green the impact on the additional taxi out times and in pink the impact on the additional asthma or approach times. The impact on the peak service rate on top informs in absolute terms of how many movements per hour are lost, assuming always enough demand, while the impact on the additional times informs of the increase in delay per flight due to the imbalances of performance between configurations. These indicators combine both the impact in terms of movement lost or uh, minutes of delay with the probability of it. In here, we can observe a couple of airports, Oslo and Malaga, where the impact on both the peak service rate and additional times is significant. Then we also observe airports where the impact on peak service rate is low, but there is an important imbalance in, in performance between configurations. And finally, there are airports where that despite having a significant loss in peak service rate or imbalance in peak service rate, the impact on performance is not so high. This is probably because these airports have some configurations that are used for very low demand. Therefore, the peak service rate will show up uh, very low, but there is no real impact on the performance. Beyond the overview results of for, for all airports, the technical note includes in the annex a detailed view per airport where we dig in the configurations, the layout and the dependencies and of course the results in terms of capacity and performance. In conclusion, the study offers a data-driven methodology for the identification of the runway configuration, which we didn't have before, and that we will be using uh, as support for more of our uh, performance studies. The peak service rate 
it could not be it could not really represent the, the maximum or the runway system capacity if there is not enough demand. So we will continue working to find a better methodology for an analytical capacity model. However, until then, this proxy gives a good enough indication. Thanks to the data-driven approach, the resilience indicator is dynamic, its evolution can be monitored, and specific periods can be considered. For most of the 90 airports analyzed, no drastic decreasing capacity was observed related to a configuration change. However, it was very interesting analyzing case by case and seeing which are the actual runway configurations in use and what are the impact on the delays. Thank you very much. As you know, the study is available in our website. I think they also put the link in the chat. If you have any questions, any comments, or even, even any requests for, for information on your specific airports, please, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this um, presentation. Um, we are currently about 250 participants. I've seen that there were already three questions asked, two were answered. Um, we keep on answering the questions in parallel and keep a few for the end. I would like now to hand over to Matthias to give us a little bit a take, um, a feedback on, on what has been presented and also what is in the study from a more airline perspective, please. Thank you, Mark. Good morning to everybody. It's, it's a pleasure talking to you. Um, I have been asked to talk a bit about my experience, uh, how airlines rate uh, airport reliability, punctuality, and, and how airport capacity imbalances might uh, influence the entire business. Um, so <clears throat> the problem has been nicely described, the root causes and the problem. I was charged with two key questions. What does it mean for an airline to get to more reliable slots in an hour? And if you turn around the question, what is the impact of airport capacity imbalances on airline operations? <laughs> so let me start Matthias, a bit. Just, yes, sorry to introduce, uh, stop you. Could you eventually put your presentation in um, presentation yes, done, mode done. so that we can yep. see it better? Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so let me start with the connectivity paradigm, which is driving airlines a lot. I've, I've randomly taken a hub profile of an airline. I've taken an elder one in, in, in order not to be close to some kind of confidentiality issues. Uh, so this is a slot profile I've chosen of Turkish Airlines at the old Istanbul uh, ATK airport. Um, so airlines schedule their performance in waves in order to enable connectivity. Um, this is, is the key paradigm of hub operations. So these colored codes here, um, I want to point on, on two things. So pink means uh, flights into Europe. Above this line, we see flights uh, outbound from an airport and below this line, we see uh, flights into this airport. For example, the blue one is coming from uh, from Southeast Asia, the pink one uh, go into Europe. So this is a highly sophisticated system, uh, which of course for, for uh, Pax perception uh, reasons, uh, needs a high resilience and a high stability. Um, airlines are always keen to have a harmonized so-called triple A performance, means uh, the airline itself has to be prudent in terms of scheduling, operational re reliability, crew availability, aircraft availability, and so on. Airports are the second major player in the system with a view to terminal setup, ground handling, operational reliability, baggage handling for sure. And then ATC is the third player in the system. And they need to be harmonized and they, uh, they need to be put together in, uh, in, in order to reach the so-called AAA performance. Let's dive a bit deeper into this first wave. Um, so uh, we, we see here the inbounds, the, again, the blue color, uh, this is Southeast Asia, the pink color is Europe. Um, so the airline creates connections in, in this case, which I've picked um, be between 
Asian inbounds and, and European outbounds, and this is a connection uh, via, via Istanbul. So what is driving these kind of connections? Of course, the bigger the airline is, the more connections will be possible. It's a clear logic. But then the more peaky the waves are, uh, the more movements per hour I can do, uh, leads me to, to, to an even higher number of connections, which I can realize, let's say, with, within a window of 60 minutes. And this window starts after the minimum connecting time, and then the duration of the window is 60 minutes. Sometimes you, you can also choose 90 minutes or, or whatsoever. But uh, so the, 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 peaky, the, the more peaky the wave is, the more connections the airline can achieve. Um, the next point then would be uh, the minimum connecting time. The shorter the minimum connecting time is, um, the better uh, the, the competitiveness uh, of, of this connection can be rated in, in the display of the global distribution system. Um, for the passenger, uh, clearly important is the seamless transfer. Means uh, I have a transfer connection in the same terminal. Um, uh, it, it is uh, air side to air side, uh, um, short walks, uh, uh, short ways to walk. So this, this is an important factor also, which of course is being reflected in the minimum connecting time. Um, I already have mentioned the optimized cooperation amongst all service providers, and these operations must be reliable. Um, Customers more and more tend to select their transfers also by the reputation of the airline, by the online reputation and by the reliability of these transfers. Um, it is not only the hub airline uh, which operates at this airport. This is clear to everybody. Uh, so here is another snapshot. This is an example of, of Vienna. You can see the, the blue colored uh, movements in and out. Uh, this is the hub carrier Austrian Airlines and the gray colored uh, uh, bars around that are movements by other carriers. Uh, so these are low cost carriers and other le legacy carriers. So if there is a non reliability of airline operation and, and airport operation up upcoming, there's little room for uh, uh, movement and, and little room in order to heal it. So it, it will, from an airport perspective, it will be a major disturbance of the entire system. Um, Moving forward, so this connectivity paradigm has been driving airlines majorly um, in, in, in the 90s and in the 2000s. Uh, the perspective has changed a little bit. I have to raise it uh, in order to, to uh, paint a more complete picture of, of what is important for airlines. So <laughs> the key USP in the 2000s was the shortest connection being displayed uh, on page number one of the global distribution system. Today, it is from a PAX perspective, the cheapest, the, the cheapest connection, not the shortest, the cheapest connection being displayed, for example, on, 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 on Skyscanner or any other meta search engine. Um, in earlier years, it was more the service on board. In these years, it is the service on ground, uh, lounges, fast track, hassle-free transfer, punctuality, safety, and security. Um, so the, the topic of operational reliability even has increased uh, from a passenger's perspective. And the distribution, when it happened in the, in the earlier years, uh, mainly via GDSs and travel agents, today you have direct bookings, you have online travel agents, you have meta searchers, and uh, very important is also here the, uh, the cooperation of these distribution channels with uh, uh, customer retention management, with uh, frequent flyer programs and so on. And the last topic uh, which has changed is um, some 10 or even 20 years ago, you, you had limited numbers of options to travel and you also have been prepared or passengers have been prepared to choose itineraries with different providers back and forth. Today, it is imperative uh, for an airline to offer connectivity into two directions. Uh, to have multiple connections a day. And what we are facing today are many more direct flights um, uh, especially also through low-cost uh, carriers. So the connectivity paradigm, let's say, has been depeaked a bit, but nonetheless, uh, the operational, uh, the demand for operational reliability has even increased in importance. Now, I've, I've made a case, uh, this is very hypothetical, but, but uh, to give you an idea of, of what it means in terms of monetary topics. 
I've taken a case from JFK flying into a European hub and then connecting in, into destinations like Berlin, Leipzig, Dresden, or even also Athens or Prague. Um, I've taken an A330 uh, operation, uh, taken average data across the year, have anonymized it a bit. Um, so in essence, uh, this flight itself makes a profit, and this, is a, this was a good flight, it was a real asset to the airline, makes a profit per flight of uh, roughly 11,000 euro, and then the connecting revenue uh, was another 9,600, so almost 10,000 euro. So this is somehow the value. And, and as we talk about slot pairs, um, the, the entire connecting value of a slot pair is 20,000 euro per flight. Um, one remark has to be made here uh, in the Middle East, connecting revenues may be, uh, may be way higher because it's, it's a different geography which is being combined. Um, uh, and and uh, this calculation does not uh, consider the cost share of connecting flights. Um, this is a lengthy discussion with, which would be clearly beyond the today's uh, meeting. But uh, so the question is here, was it the right question? Do we positively talk about the value or should we, should we also consider what, what does it mean uh, if this connection fails? Um, so here is a business case on the next page. Um, what does it mean for an airline operation if the airport slot is non-reliable uh, due to airport capacity imbalance, for example? Um, so what are the commercial parameters? The number of, passenger, of transfer passengers per flight were 107. So my assumption was 50% will, uh, will miss their connection. Out of those, uh, 20 packs can be rebooked and uh, on own airline connections, okay, this can be done at, at, with cost neutral effects. 20 more parks have to be rebooked on third party airlines. Of course, then uh, this, does not, this does not go along with the so-called connected revenue. You have to pay a higher price potentially for, for uh, this kind of uh, connection. Uh, maybe for another 14 flights, you have to go for a hotel arrangement and book a connection uh, the next day. And out of these uh, 55 passengers, uh, 25 might claim for compensation for major delay. So in total, this means if, if, uh, if the slot is not reliable, be it airport capacity imbalance or, or, or any other reason, um, the total cost per delayed flight here would, would uh, ramp up towards an amount of 11,000 uh, euros. So it would completely eat up the entire connecting revenue. And this is a hypothetical case. Of course, it, it may be volatile in its effects up or down. Uh, what we didn't consider here in this consideration is the brand damage to the airline and the cost of all other rotational delays, uh, which, which uh, happen throughout the day uh, due to this one delay uh, for, for, for which reason ever. Um, rotational delays could be aircraft uh, and, and, and cost of rotational delays could be uh, due to aircraft reallocations, crew reallocations, uh, and, and so on. Um, so this is a rough business case. Let me come to my conclusion. Um, airline wave patterns have been depicted slightly. So the connectivity paradigm has, has, uh, has been replaced by, by other more important things like what I've said, uh, reliability and hassle-free transfer. Nonetheless, Airline hubs are still based on intensive connectivity planning. That's the nature of a hub. That's a function of a hub. Um, airline hub uh, management requires not only sophistication by the airline itself, uh, but a seamless and harmonized cooperation amongst all vendors. And, and this is especially the airport and the air traffic control. And um, as, as airports are often slot restricted or even slot congested, uh, any kind of delay will have a disastrous impact on the uh, on the punctuality. There's virtually no leeway for for uh, any capacity restrictions um, due to capacity imbalances. Um, this business case, what I've presented to you, uh, shows easily um, that the cost of delay easily eat up um, uh, the connecting revenue of a long haul flight and. Um, well, that's it. That's it in basic terms. Uh, so 
uh, from an airline perspective, it cannot be rated high enough uh, to have reliable airport operations uh, uh, and, and uh, reliable slot profiles uh, in this sense. That's it from my corner. Thank you very much uh, for listening and I hand back to the moderator. Thank you very much, Matthias, for this uh, very interesting and, and also uh, very illustrative um, view you have presented and the importance uh, it has for the airlines. Let's move now to the airport side and the airport planning side in particular. So, Manuel, welcome. And uh, we're going to listen to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Okay, capacity balance uh, from the airport planning perspective. Let's talk a little bit on Madrid Barajas Airport, how we did it for a given airport uh, in the forecast. The first idea, the first that comes is that uh, our maybe one of the most important is the runway capacity. We all calculate before starting planning, we all calculate the runway capacity. I think we all use analytical tools, fast time simulation. In our case, we use pickup, which is an approved, validated by our Spanish authorities, fast time simulation methodology. It calculates capacity of the runway based on physical layout, procedures, traffic mix, uh, fleet, uh, that's it. So after runway capacity, which is something dealing with procedures, fleet mix, and so on, uh, are there other capacities? Of course, air traffic control capacity. And this case is more complex. Uh, we have approach sectors, we have tower positions, each tower position, clearance departure, ground controller, local departure, local arrival, they, they have their own capacities. We Again, in the planning, um, in the planning uh, stage, we, we had to calculate the, 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 the a approach controllers capacity and so on. We use for that the scope. A scope is as well a validated uh, methodology, standard methodology. Scope is a methodology, but uh, it uses actually um, normal, uh, everybody knows, commercial fast time simulation tools. In any case, we get all those capacities and we have to be sure that the coordinated capacity in the end uh, slots should have a gap because we cannot plan more uh, flights than expected. So that's the framework. What happened with uh, Madrid airport? Recent evolution. Back in 1998, we, we, have, um, we decided, we realized actually, that we would need more runways in the future because just because demand was growing up. Uh, only runways uh, now in year 2000, Plan Barajas was, was called, started designing new tower, new terminals, new layout for a brand new taxiway system. Even new TMA, everything had to be uh, redesigned. Uh, in, 2006, uh, it all started operation, and we are still are facing some, not unbalanced, but some unsymmetric uh, problems or issues that we are finding that are going against a balanced capacity, but we, we are solving them. I will end with uh, some quick view on the capacity determination, because this is the key point. As soon as you plan, you need to determine capacity and um, you have to go on reviewing it. That, that's the performance review. Let's go for the new language. We start from here and we end it in here. Uh, as you can see, that's like building a brand new airport parallel to the old airport. It's like that. Uh, we are, since we are talking about um, configuration balance, this is these are the configurations we're using. North configuration, departures to the north, arrivals to the north and south configuration. It's parallel language. All of them intended to intended to be uh, uh, simultaneous approaches uh, to parallel language and uh, intended, I say, uh, uh, because we are still facing some some problems to to solve that and. Um, uh, independent departures. North is like 70-80% of the, of the time. When planning the new runways in 1998, one question, is there configuration symmetry? Okay, 
weather and winds. What happened with weather? Very quick, this is an old picture, but uh, it, 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 it's useful. Uh, this is mm, day winds, north. Okay, that's quite symmetric because the airport points to the north. Um, night winds, not that much traffic during night, but it's not that symmetric. We have a component, southwest component over here. So well, symmetry is broken. Master plan. We had to decide, okay, we're, we were building parallel runways. Parallel to what? Parallel to, we had to decide and we went because they, these were better for performance uh, uh, for the airport building. Uh, these were the, the, the right option, but Alden has different, different uh, uh, performance in the end. Traffic, most of the traffic to Madrid and Spain comes, uh, the traffic to Symmetric, the answer is no. We have mountains to the north. So there. Approaches from. The north to the south in altitude. North, uh, configuration. We have this airport. This is a visual, no problem. Torhon, we send the. the Private jet aviation to Torrejon. Um, this is a problem different in South and in North. What about the environment? And, it's, and a slide for environment. This is Madrid city. We have a lot of towns over here, a lot of uh, villages. Uh, it's symmetric. There's SIDs and stars surrounding, regarding population. Look at this. Uh, we intended to have independent departures, no problem in South because we have. 15 degrees divergence in here. We have in north 15 degrees divergence, but there is a turn to the right to the same direction. The SOIR uh, ICAO documentation has not solved this. So we are solving it right now, but so far this is not symmetric because the departures to the north are not purely independent. Another problem to solve, but what solved little we are solving it and most of it is already on, on, on its way to be solved. Plan Barajas 2000 dealt with uh, some draft designs, again, configuration symmetry. What about new terminal, taxiway system, ground control? This is a draft, actually. This terminal does not exist at all. Uh, and the flaws are a little bit different, similar to this one, but uh, you can imagine that um, Runway capacity is all the problem, but taxiway of a complex, a very complex airport like this one is, is a problem. And again, I will tell you, by the time we were simulating the airport, we found a, a conflict point over here. There were some other, but the, a big merging point of flows over here. Um, that point that still exists. And again, we are solving it and we have merged capacities in South and North but the conflict is different in South and in North. It is, it is because, because the flows are different because you have to move flights from this terminal to this runway, from this runway to this terminal, and they don't cross exactly the same and they don't use exactly the same uh, uh, taxiways. Uh, um, this is, uh, there's something else dealing with the flows, which is apron allocation policies. Uh, we had some alliances at the moment we were planning. Now alliances have changed. One World, Eastern Alliance, and many other alliances have changed, and they changed the flows, and they are different in North and South. Very quickly, this is a scanned, very old picture of the TMA. Now it's a little bit different, but just very quickly. 50, this is the balance of runways in North configuration, departure 50, 50 more or less, okay. 40, 60, not that good, but it's okay. North, uh, here it is, 35, 65. Okay, in North is not, in South, sorry, it's not that easy to balance uh, the runways. So another problem to be solved. It all was more or less solved and we started operation in 2006. 
What happened then? Was everything working? Final configuration symmetry after deployment. Okay, I was talking about alliances. Uh, it seemed that alliances were more or less solved, but then in the year 2000, Ryanair didn't exist. <laughs> that, that's reality. Uh, all low cost didn't exist as they are now. Okay, Ryanair actually, they existed uh, at that moment, but, um, but uh, now they are completely different there. Uh, the alliances have changed. So we have to go on changing if we don't want flows are very, very different in north, in north and south configuration and, and change capacity. Uh, other airports, I told you about Torrejón, that airport very close to Madrid. This is a, a draft picture, but private jet aviation was uh, was provoking. Uh, uh, um, we have to break the the arrival rate because of this configuration. So all the uh, private jet aviation had to go back to Barajas. That was the best solution. We solved it uh, doing that because uh, otherwise not configuration, but was broken again and again. Environmental restrictions. I told you one, the departure dependencies in North, not in South. Then what happened in South? There's actually, there's a judicial sentence telling an idea that we are only allowed to, to land a given number of flights in runway, let me remember, 18 right every year. No more, that's South configuration, no more than that. So we have to apply a runway tactical usage procedure to send tactically, to send tactically uh, flights to the to, to the other parallel runway to avoid mm, a town which is in there and that's an environment problem. And that is working, but the, they, they, these things make different uh, one configuration to the other. And finally, traffic changes. Everything was planned at the beginning. And then look at this. These are the, the, the current, the current uh, uh, SIDs. Uh, Madrid, Barcelona. Madrid, Barcelona, by the time we were planning the airport, was the second uh, air shuttle in the world. The first was Sao Paulo, Rio, and the second was Madrid, Barcelona. So uh, Barcelona is over here. Uh, and you can imagine that this, um, this route was fed uh, at that moment by the, the second air shuttle in, in, in the world. Then at a given moment, they built a, a high-speed train between Madrid and Barcelona, and now the shuttle is peanuts. Yeah, that's life. Uh, everything has changed, and that we, if we want to balance this and cause no, 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 no disruption, we are we are using actually the way we are solving it is by is by using wildcard routes. They are not tactical routes; they are planning routes. We we have to move. Uh, traffic, because as I said, most of the traffic comes from Europe, from the northeast. Uh, uh, some traffic going to this point now are uh, deviated to that other point because the the shuttle is not working anymore. Sorry, balance, Oops. balance capacity. At the end of the day, we have this configuration: 80, uh, 70, 80 north. Uh, this is quite symmetric. Most of the problems were solved. Uh, north to the right um, okay we have in here this arrival departure window okay this is operational uh, we have a blocking like a blocking window because uh, the misapproaches of the arrivals are overflying this runway and there are departures here okay hopefully it's almost symmetric in south configuration so capacity is affected in the same way uh, Simultaneous approaches to parallel languages are on its way to be uh, in, um, used in Spain, but uh, we are in the way of approving them by our authorities. But now we are using the same diagonal separation. So in the end, we have minor differences now in North and South in runway capacity, minor, but they affect runway capacity, approach capacity and tower capacity. And because they are minor, the Balance declared capacity is the same, 100 and so on. All that was addressed by running more and more studies. In the planning period, more than 50 fast and simulation studies were run in, in those years, along those years. And 
many other safety uh, analysis, uh, environmental analysis, operational. Uh, from 2006 onwards, uh, there are new enhancements at all levels, airport tower TMA, uh, new enhancement going on right now. And hopefully we now have fast time simulation studies, which are a standard. Pick up, I mentioned it for runway capacity, a scope for a TC workload capacity. And uh, the good thing is that both pick up and a scope are a standard fast time simulation methods for capacity calculation that help us a lot. And they are approved by the Spanish authorities. So they are somehow uh, uh, legal. Uh, um, uh, results. Uh, they are approved by the uh, safety agency and the uh, civil aviation general directory. Now more than 100 sectors and 15 airports are uh, simulated every year to comply with an area needs and Spanish authorities requirements. And also, I forgot to put it down here, but uh, AENA, which is the airport um, operator, the biggest airport operator now in Spain, they, they request, they, they keep on planning uh, changes in airports and they request us to run simulations so that capacity is calculated and, and capacity is, is uh, as balanced as possible for all airports. And um, that's all, thank you. Well, well, thank you very much for um, your presentation. Um, in the beginning, we had we had some audio issues and also some bandwidth issues. So, but I think uh, towards the end, everybody catched up with you, and it was very very interesting to to listen to you how you plan into uh, the future without really knowing how the future will look like. So, thank you very much for this contribution. So, we move on and get some sort of airport operations perspective with uh, Mates, please. Hello, everybody. Many thanks, uh, Mark. Ladies and gentlemen, in my presentation, I will focus on the operational aspects and give an overview on how we deal with capacity limitations of certain runway configuration. I will first give an overview of the operational concepts at Zurich Airport and how they affect the punctuality. And in the second part of my presentation, I will give you insights how we deal with this topic. So on this slide, you can see an overview of the main runway operating concepts. In Zurich, we have three runways with two of them crossing each other. The main landing direction in each concept is indicated by a, by a blue arrow here and the main takeoff direction with a red, red arrow. Typically, we operate the south concept in the morning. This is the first, first hour. We open it at six o'clock. And afterwards, the north concept is a normally flown concept during the day. And in the evening, we switch to the east concept. The north concept is a concept with the best capacity. However, due to restrictions over Germany, we cannot operate this concept in the morning or in the evening hours. In addition to these three standard concepts, there's also the so-called BESA concept. This you see here on the, on the right, which is used uh, during special wind conditions. Especially this concept has a huge impact on the punctuality when it has to be used. You can see why on this slide, the concept is our worst concept in terms of capacity and also complexity, since we have a lot of dependencies on the ground and in the air. On the ground, we have the two runway we have the runway crossings here of the two departure runways it's here. And it's a conflict between the go round and the runway on the runway uh, one, on the main landing runway one four, and the take of 10 here. And we have uh, to make it even more complicated, the arrival and the departure routes have many crossing points in the air, as you can see here in the, in the right picture. Let's have a quick look on the airport capacity. 
you can see the airport slot capacity over the day in, in that uh, colored orange bars. And the traffic demand per weekday in black for reference week uh, during summer season 2019. What you can see here is that there's less capacity offered in the morning and in the evening hours. So here in the morning and here in the evening. That is due to the fact that we operate not the optimum runway concept north at these times. So the limitations in the morning and in the evening are reflected in the capacity values. However, resin related changes are not reflected, of course. If we have to switch to B, the concept, the capacity is significantly reduced, which you can see here under normal weather, we have that capacity here. And during B, it is drastically removed, uh, down, reduced. What is the effect on the punctuality? Here you see one example of April 2019. At that day here, you see the day, here you see the, the time. We have south concept in the morning, then we switch to the, to the north concept. And during that day, around about noon, we switch to, to be the concept for several hours. And you see here, end of the day, we end up with a punctuality of, of around about uh, 50%. You see another representation of that specific day. Here's the red line, shows the departure punctuality with a clear drop around noon, where we switch to this visa uh, concept. As you can see, at that day, it was not possible to recover the punctuality drop to the target of 80% here. So how does Zurich Airport deal with that topic? In principle, we follow three approaches. Strategically, in the long term, we are working towards eliminating the capacity gaps between the individual concepts. This is achieved by adapting the affected concept and creating the legal basis to be able to use them operationally. That's the first pillar here. The second approach is to continuously increase capacity within existing boundaries. This can be achieved by implementing new tools or techniques that reduced, for example, the final approach spacing like implementation of RECAT EU. However, we will not be able to increase capacity, respectively close the gaps quickly, but we can reduce the operational impact through proactive management of the airport operation, which is the third point on the slide. Here you can see the ongoing strategic adjustment for the visa concept. The new visa concept here on, on the right side will have equal or even more capacity than the today's main concept north. However, the process to implement that concept here is uh, ongoing, but will still take years due to the long political process. proactive management of an airport operation. From our point, as an essential element in dealing with capacity limitations, we see the change of, of mindset from reactive way of working to proactive way. Today, we react on disruptions like adverse weather or technical problems. In the future, we want to predict such situations before they have an impact on the operation. How do we want to achieve this? Mainly with better cooperation between us and our main stakeholders, the air traffic control sky guide, Swiss International Airlines, the ground handler, and the local MET provider. And by implementing new supporting systems like the airport operation plan, so-called AOP, and demand capacity balancing tools. On the way 
towards uh, proactive management, the operational outlook call was set up in 2019, which takes place daily in the afternoon. At this telephone conference, we together with SkyGuide, Meteo, uh, Meteo Swiss and uh, Swiss International Airlines discuss the operational issues for the next day with the aim to be better prepared. Specifically for that call, uh, uh, the, for this call, a briefing sheet has been developed, which you can see here on the, on the right hand side. In the top, the meteorological conditions for the next 24 hours are presented based and based on big data and machine learning technique, a forecast of the expected runway concept and the likelihood is generated, which you can see here in the, at the bottom is here presented. In the shown example, the concept visa was predicted in the afternoon, starting at uh, two o'clock p.m. for four hours with a likelihood of uh, very likely. This sheet here is generated and distributed automatically five times a day. The main goal of the briefing sheet are creating common situational awareness, show operational restrictions due to expected weather conditions, create consistent decision-making and promote proactive decision-making. For the future, we plan to expand the forecast period from 24 hours to direction 36 hours, and we want to add data fields and increase the data resolution. In addition, we intend to implement mutually agreed mitigation measures based on threshold values. Proactive management in the sense of optimizing the overall airport system is difficult to achieve if each stakeholder optimizes only for himself, which is often the case in the past. We want to travel the journey towards proactive management to together with our partners. We have a vision. Together with our partners, the Air Traffic Control Skyguide and Swiss International Airlines, we want to be to become the most integrative airport system in Europe by 2030. Last year, our three COOs signed a letter of intent laying out the strategy how to reach this. The vision is based on these three main pillars here. It is performance steering and optimization, development and digital transformation. All three pillars are needed to achieve a proactive integrated management of airport operation. Major projects such as AOP or improved data exchange to achieve the goal have been or will be started this year. Ladies and gentlemen, capacity limitation and the impact of certain runway configuration will probably never be complete get rid of. With a strategic approach of reducing or closing the gaps long term and the proactive management of the airport operation we want to continue along this path for the benefit of our passenger also in the future i hope i could, could give a brief overview on this topic thank you very much thank you very much mattes and uh... If I may, BISA is not an acronym. It's a weather phenomena, which is actually a, a canalization of current air between the Northern Alps and the Jura. So it is something which is, is coming uh, regularly in winter and also uh, in, in summer. So just to make clear that. Yes, uh, yes. It's not an acronym. It's, it's, it's a special wind yeah, here exactly. in, in the Alps. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much, Mate. So we move on to our last, but certainly not least speaker, and the only one who has no letter Mike Alpha in his name today on the panelist and, and on the organizers. Very interesting coincidence. Didier, please, we're looking forward to listening to you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a view from the slot coordinators uh, in, this, in this panel. 
And I didn't notice that I was the only one not having an MA in my name today. So, um, so um, uh, something very interesting that I heard from my colleagues before is that at the end, the problem that we all have in case of imbalance uh, on the runway capacity between, because of the runway configuration is is resulting from the difference that we can do between planning and the effective operations. And it brings us back directly to the airport slot uh, concepts. So um, I think it's important to, to, to come back to some definitions of what is the airport uh, uh, coordination uh, about. It, it's not a, a fundamental solution to, to, to the fundamental to the problems uh, of, uh, of lack of airport capacity. It's, it's, uh, it should be seen as a solution, an interim solution uh, to manage the, the, the problem of the lack of capacity compared to the demand uh, until the long-term solutions can be found. That, that's, that's very important. Um, the objective is uh, to ensure that, that uh, the most efficient declaration and allocation of, of the of the usage of the capacity available um, is made and to optimize the, the benefits for all the, not only the consumers, but also the users of this capacity. So what is an airport slot? Simple definition, it's, uh, it's a permission that is given by a coordinator for a planned operation to use the airport infrastructure necessary uh, to arrive or depart at a coordinated airport on a specific date and time. And we are again back to planning or activity as, as well slot coordinators is to um, plan the, the demand according to the capacity that is available. That's the main thing. Who are the relevant stakeholders in the airport coordination? Uh, uh, all the parties that are involved are also the airlines and other aircraft operation operators because uh, it's not only the airlines, it's also the general business aviation, could be military operations and, and others. Um, so these people who are uh, planning to use the airport, cap the airport infrastructure for their operations. The airport managing body, of course, because they are the administrator of the airport facilities. The air traffic control, because it's responsible for all the airport, the movements on the airport and uh, the airspace uh, that is uh, leading the aircraft to the airport or taking the aircraft from the airport to elsewhere. The coordinator or facilitator, depending on the level of the, of the airport, who are responsible for the coordination of this airport. The government authorities, of course, because they are responsible for the airport, also um, responsible for the additional constraints that may be that may be um, added on top of the physical constraints of an airport. I mean, I'm speaking here about environmental constraints or other regulations. So we know that the airport are designated uh, as level two or level or level one, two and three. A level one airport is an airport where you have no cap, no problem of capacity according to the demand. A level two is a, an airport where you may have a, 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 a short period of uh, of uh, high demand compared to the to the to the capacity available, and there you have a scheduled facilitator who is uh, by dialogue is trying to uh restore the good balance between the demand and the capacity and then you have these airports of level three um, that we all know all these big airports where there is more demand than capacity available and it uh, must be addressed correctly uh, by an independent uh, coordinator so it takes uh, the, the capacity declaration uh, that is used to create the capacity parameters, coordination parameters used by the coordinator is the result of um, capacity, um, capacity analysis, capacity and demand analysis um, to determine what is the maximum capacity available for the allocation of, of the airport slots, considering the functional physical limitations at the airport, 
runway, uh, apron, terminal, airspace. Uh, also, the 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 the, the path, the ways uh, that are bringing the the passengers to the airport. Also, it's also an element, and uh, eventually environmental restrictions uh, like um, night restrictions for aircraft of a certain level of noise and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this capacity demand analysis should, must be made before each uh, scheduling season. It's important that it's done because it, it gives the possibility to evaluate if the capacity is still uh, accurate, uh, if there is anything that has changed that uh, may eventually reduce or increase the capacity to be made available. Eventually also take into consideration major works uh, 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 runway reconstruction, for example, may have a significant impact on the capacity for a period of a season. It should be integrated uh, when it's significant enough. It should be integrated in the in the planning and in the capacity available for this period. So um, the capacity, the demand capacity analysis, is made uh, generally on two levels. You have the the, the land side and the air side. The air side is the air side capacity demand is is uh, made by ATC in general should be, and the land side is made by the airport managing body. Um, I said before that it should be completed in a timely manner at, at the right time so that we can be used correctly by the coordinator. Um, it should objectively, and it is very important um, in, in some cases, it should uh, objectively consider the ability, the ability of the airport infrastructure to accommodate the demand um, at some applicable service level, such as queue times, levels of congestions, delays, while uh, taking into account the relevant airspace limitations set by the local ATC uh, authority. Um, it should provide the relevant capacity limits of the runway, apron, terminals, and other airport facilities as deemed necessary. Um, who are or what are the factors that can create imbalance between the capacity and the demand? Of course, we as coordinator, and I, 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 I was, I was, uh, I found very interesting that uh, all the other panelists before me uh, were speaking a lot about uh, the planning, and and um, and the the imbalance does not always come from bad planning, it comes also from the circumstances in the operation. So we all recognize that there may be a difference between what is planned and the way it's planned and what is the actual uh, reality in operations that is highly influenced by the operational circumstances of the day. That could be the weather, that could be any other factors uh, like works here and there or whatever you can imagine. So what can create an imbalance already at the level of the planning? It's uh, if the capacity analysis was not done properly and for all parameters. If you evaluate only the runway capacity, but you do not take uh, pay, pay consideration to the planning for the parking um, uh, stands uh, that you have available, it may create a, a, a huge uh, imbalance that have that will have an influence on the, on the usage of the runway, of course. Um, if the analysis made by one of the capacity provider is not correctly reflecting in, uh, reflected in the capacity declaration, just what I said before, and eventually, in some cases, if the pressure of the, if the commercial pressure takes the leads on some uh, uh, evaluation of the of the operational performance and the, the 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 continuity on the quality of the operational performance. How can we avoid that situation of imbalance between uh, uh, already happened at, at the planning side? Uh, you know that the, the the capacity declaration should be endorsed by a coordination committee. That is, a coordination committee uh, exists at all coordinated airports uh, normally. Um, so this coordination committee should review the capacity analysis and the capacity declaration to guarantee that this capacity is set 
in a way that the, that it will support appropriate capacity for normal operation situations. Of course, we look at what is the most used runway configuration at all airports, and it was also shown by by um, by some panelists before me. Uh, there, there is always one uh, one main uh, runway configuration at, at an airport, and this is the one that is used to declare the capacity of the airport. Um, and then this coordination committee should also question itself uh, to evaluate if it's the right way to do to do the things uh, when you are including a reasonable delay in already in the in the capacity declaration or when you know that by setting the capacity declaration at the highest level you are pushing the the the, the system to its last um, last possibility or to to, to its maximum of uh, of capacity then you you cannot expect that in case of uh, operational dis uh, disruption um, you will have a very high resilience if you already in the planning phase you are putting everything uh, uh, to the extreme um, but that's a choice and that's a choice that is, that is made by the people who are involved in the in the, in the approval of the capacity declaration and um, should be also uh, accepted later when there are disruptions eventually. Um, something that may happen sometimes also is that one of the stakeholders of the capacity providers uh, determined a, a, a certain level of capacity for its for its own uh, factor, but that at the end it's not uh, taken into account or it's override uh, overrided by by the coordination committee. It shouldn't happen, of course. Um, I wanted to also, because I, I found very interesting the demonstration made by our colleague or of the representing so, so the airline's point of view. Um, of course, when we make a, a very, when we make an accurate uh, capacity declaration, it's one side. It's the way that the airport is uh, determining um, what are the best way to allocate the capacity uh, and to have a, a good performance at the airport. It is also the role of all the stakeholders who are using this capacity to put their demand with uh, realistic uh, parameters. It could be appropriate minimum connected time, but it's also a, a problem that we see more and more the, the to, to to have uh, operations planned with uh, short uh, rotation time that are not always very realistic and as such it's a problem of capacity but when we are in in the, in the in the situation of uh, disruption and that the pressure on the runway capacity or the airport system in general is already high um, if the demand is not planned correctly, uh, it increases the pressure on the operation on, at that time and on the system at that time. So um, it is the role, that's my, my conclusions are, it is the role of all the stakeholders participating to this uh, capacity analysis uh, to declare the airport capacity correctly or to assume at least uh, the decisions that are, are made. Um, many stakeholders are present in the coordination committee and are coordinated there also. It is the role of these stakeholders to guarantee that the capacity is uh, made to find the best usage of this capacity. And uh, it includes also a particular attention to the punctuality and the regularity of operations. And because all our processes are uh, um, uh, a repetition uh, years after year. Of course, when we do a capacity analysis and capacity declaration, capacity allocation, allocation of airport slot, it's important to understand at the end of the process how these uh, these plannings have been realized, and it's valid for 
all the stakeholders. Uh, it's important to understand how these planning were realized and to also take the right conclusions for the evaluation of the capacity demand analysis of the next equivalent CC. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Didier. I would like to, to ask all the speakers to uh, come up. Maybe, Didier, you can stop sharing the, the screen. And uh, we have uh, 10 minutes left for some question and answers. And there was a question which was asked via the question and answer mode from Michael Schmeichel. And I think, uh, Mathes, you wanted to answer to, to this question. The question is, what was the time horizon for the decision to go to Bizemov in your example when the punctuality was down at 52%? So what are possible measures to increase the punctuality in Zurich? I think that's the question. There will be another question then later on on ACDM. So for, for the speakers, please have a look because I'm, uh, somebody else might go for this, uh, for this question. Mathes, your turn. I hope you can hear me. I'm not able to start my video, but uh, yes. I can tell you, I give, can give you an answer to this question. So as I mentioned in my presentation, we have this uh, O2 call. So it's a, it's a, a telephone conference the day before. There, the, 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 the Meteo Swiss gives an overview of the upcoming day. And there we maybe is also, uh, they highlight there will be a tendency for that, for that visa. And, and the day after, so at the operating day in the morning at six o'clock, just before the airport opens, is also a telephone conference uh, with the same attendances. And they will also inform again if there is a um, disruption or a visa. But in general, today, the decision when to change the, the con concept from North to visa is, is taken by, is take by SkyGuide. And they look really on the actual wind figures and decide on really short notice when, when uh, depending on the current wind, when, when to shift to the from north to Bise, because they know when they shift to Bise, it is really a mess for us at the airport. So they are trying to, 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 to stay to north how long they can. Thank you very much, uh, Mates. The other question is from Ignacio Otero. How is capacity imbalance handled in real-time management in airports with ACDM implemented? Should the capacity imbalance be included in the ACDM manual with its particular procedure? Has any airport so far contemplated including it? So maybe it's a question for Sara, but, uh, or maybe for Didier. I don't know who wants to go. Um, all right, so yeah, I was I was thinking that maybe Mates because actually that's um, um, sorry gives ACDM implemented, right? And uh, uh, therefore, yes. therefore, that's exactly what he has presented. I think what how they deal with this capacity imbalance from their side, but I think he's the better person to answer. But I think it is. Uh mentioned in the ACDM manual. So you have also a menu for uh, snow. So adverse weather condition, we have also snow and in during snow uh, season, we have also a reduction in capacity. And when I look at the DPI implementation guide and the API implementation guide published by rule control last year, that is more than one time mentioned that you control is interested in that long longer time horizons and so on so that the information is uh, available earlier and can can justify it by by the stakeholder thank so you. from my point I, I did not see that that we need an, an an update of the manual but maybe somebody from your controls can say something so Thank you. I don't know if there is anybody who, who manages the ADM, uh, ACDM manual on the call, but um, we pick up the, the, the question in case if there is a need to answer it later on. There was one question, about, but maybe we let off the hook, Mattes, but it was also for you, actually, but maybe 
Manuel can come in here. Do you use feedback from the day-to-day -day performance analysis to provide input in the airport development planning process? Yes, yes, we do that. So we have a, a call, which is uh, every, or is it's not a call, it, it is a meeting. It is a seven days meeting where we look uh, in the past and, and uh, also have, have an outlook of, of the upcoming week. And we have uh, also a, a, a team with, with data analysts, which, which continuously analyzing the, the past and, and we have so that we have uh, tackle issues and bring the operation for, uh, to a better. So yes, it's a well, continuously process from an, at our airport. Thank you. And I, yes, as Matt has, uh, has explained, this is a continuous process. We keep on uh, improving and changing and trying to obtain more capacity together with the airport operator, which is Aena in our case. And we are in constantly uh, simulating and analyzing how to improve capacity and in this case we are in contact directly with the control center um, the the airport itself and the IANA planners we have the day-to-day -day information thank you very much there's one more question which will be the last one it's from Paul Nehring once a capacity analysis is made why are operations pushed to the limits in capacity declaration the consequent effects of have a tremendous effect on passenger experience and airline and airport. So, smooth solution will less harm airlines and airport reputation. Is this taken into calculation? So I don't know, uh, Didier, I think you alluded to the fact that uh, there are several elements then in this, in this uh, way of, of looking at the capacity and the demand analyzing and then forecasting what actually is, is being done. So do you know of examples where it's less uh, to the optimum or, or closer to the maximum, less close to the optimum or closer to the optimum? Are there, do you have experiences in this? Well, you, 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 you can expect that uh, if you are managing an airport where the demand is so high and the wait list to access to your airport is so high that the, the pressure, the commercial pressure is, is also at the maximum. And uh, when you are with this kind of pressure and constraints, of course, you are, uh, you are naturally uh, pushed to uh, use your system at the, at the maximum of its capacity uh, to, uh, to, 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 to try to serve everybody. Um, we know some airports, I will not name any airport, but we know some airports, uh, and they will recognize themselves, um, who already include in their capacity declaration a certain level of delay, um, 10, 11 minutes something like that, if I remember well. Uh, and the same airport also, because they, they anticipate then that uh, in case of any operational disruption, it will have a huge impact on their operation. And if you are a very big airport, not only on your operation, but on the, re on the operation of the whole network and the other airports everywhere in the world when you are such a big airport. And then they have a procedure that in case of bad weather expectation tomorrow and, and a, a, a significant reduction of the capacity that will be available in operations. They asked to the airlines to already reduce their demand for the next day and to cancel a certain number of flights. So you see, it's not only pushing the system to the, to the, to the maximum level, but it's also anticipating problems and take um, some, some measures, some, create some working procedures in agreement with the airlines to, um, to, to find solutions to, to when, when, you, when you are facing these disruptions. But of course, it's not the case everywhere. And yeah, I, I wanted to insist in my presentation on the responsibility that each of the stakeholders has to take in the, in, at the coordinated airports because the coordination parameters or the, co the capacity uh, available is not declared only by one person, the airport or the coordinator, it's the responsibility of all the capacity providers and the stakeholders to agree on a correct 
capacity uh, or the correct um, uh, I mean, uh, capacity uh, parameter for for an airport. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I th think we're coming to to the end uh, of the webinar, and. Um, I would like just to quickly recall and thank our speakers and, and summarize and recall what has been said today. Jan Malako explained the, the airport capacity and balance concept. So the conceptual way of starting to look into that. Sara presented then the approach and the results of the study. Matthias showed us what a reliable ATC capacity at an airport means for an airline in, in particular for a network carrier. And uh, Manuel illustrated very nicely what are challenges when one plans new runways and it impacts on the airport uh, imbalance of capacity. So there is also a question still in the chat, which we're going to try to answer. Uh, what, what is the most important thing when you try to plan an airport? You know, do you need to look at technical and regulatory issues? But I think Manuel will, will, will do that. Uh, Matis had, has given us a very interesting presentation on showing what actually the influencing factor can be at an airport, at an airport with uh, quite some challenging runway configuration and how that is being managed uh, in a daily basis, on a daily basis with uh, as many actors involved uh, together. And Didier gave us the, the airport coordination explanation. So what does it mean to be in a, a coordinated or a de designated airport and what actually is being carried out on a seasonal level, how you plan the capacity and the demand part. Um, I would like to thank, in closing, I would like to thank to the people who have made that possible. First of all, Jan and Sarah, who had the initiative from the PRC and the PRU point of view to run this um, webinar. I would like to thank thanks, uh, David and Miriam for uh, ha having made that possible. The presentations and also the video recording will be made available uh, from your control. I wish you all a very pleasant rest of the day. Thank you very much for joining this morning.